Hello, I'm Larry Stevens, president of the Hatfield Museum and History Society, and I welcome you to this presentation of Law and Order Hatfield, PA. This presentation will focus on some of the interesting crimes that have occurred in Hatfield or that have involved Hatfield folks and range from petty theft all the way to murder. I will be presenting these crimes in chronological order and the oldest news that I was able to uncover about a Hatfield related crime dates way back to 1749, almost 275 years ago and more than 15 years before the start of the American Revolution. And I call this case the robbery of two gentlemen from Hatfield. It was August 25, 1749, and Hatfield Township residents Jacob Souter Jr. and Martin Funk, along with Funk's servant, were traveling on horseback to Philadelphia. Mr. Souter was a potter, and Mr. Funk may have been a weaver, so it's quite possible that these two men were traveling to Philadelphia together on business, taking what they had to market. And incidentally, both of these men were signers of the petition to create Hatfield Township seven years earlier in 1742. At about eight o'clock in the evening, as they were traveling in the area that would today be the nice town section of Philadelphia, just south of Germantown, a couple of Irishmen came up to them and rode along with them for a ways. After a while, the Irishmen pulled their pistols, struck Funk and Souter, and ordered them to give up their money. The frightened men gave the robbers what they had, and the thieves let them go. Well, that might have been the end of the story, except later that same evening, while a Mr. Green and his servant were traveling to Philadelphia, they too were robbed by the same men and then released. Still later that evening, the servant who had been riding with Mr. Green recognized the two bandits as they rose, rode past the Green residence in Philadelphia. The servant, according to the newspaper account, quote, raised a ruckus so that the thieves could be caught. The bandits were soon taken into custody and everything that had been taken in both robberies was found to be on the bandits. The men were soon brought in front of a local judge. Jacob Souter and Martin Funk, along with Funk's servant, were also brought before the judge to identify the men as the ones who had attacked them. The bandits, a Mr. Fielding and a Mr. Johnson, were then placed into jail to await their hearing in the Supreme Court. Subsequently, however, the two men made an unsuccessful attempt to break out of jail and were quickly executed, bringing an end to the case of the robbery of the two gentlemen from Hatfield. Thirty years later, in 1778, the Revolutionary War was going strong. This next story is about a theft, but being during a time of war, it is probably not so much a crime, but a wartime re-requisitioning, but I thought that I would include it nonetheless. And it is the story of the British capture of cattle in Hatfield. By February 1778, the British had seized Philadelphia and General Washington's Continental Army troops were encamped at Valley Forge. Due to supply chain issues, Washington had a difficult time getting his men the food and clothing that they desperately needed. And the wintertime road conditions impeded supply wagons even more. Washington's troops were in bad shape, but he had made arrangements for a herd of 130 fattened cattle to be brought from New Jersey to Valley Forge to feed his starving army. The cattle drover, with his herd of cattle, came from New Jersey to Pennsylvania by crossing the Delaware River at Howe's Ferry, today known as Stockton. Apparently, no guards were assigned to accompany the drover for protection, as was sometimes done, due to the fact that no men could be spared. While the drover's exact route is unclear, he likely herded his cattle down the old Doylestown Pike, past Doylestown and New Britain, towards Montgomery Square. It seems that to avoid detection by British troops or British sympathizers, instead of continuing south on Bethlehem Pike, 
the drover may have led his herd along the more lightly traveled Cowpath Road into Hatfield Township, perhaps with the intention of then taking them southward on the 40-foot road. On the morning of February 24, 1778, however, British soldiers intercepted the drover in Hatfield Township and took possession of his cattle. In order to avoid the herd being recaptured by colonial patriots, the soldiers drove the cattle north to the Bucks County Line, traveled along the County Line Road, then likely down York Road, and into Philadelphia. The cattle, no doubt, were greatly enjoyed by the British soldiers that occupied the revolutionary capital at that time. And so that is how Hatfield Township had a small part in this unfortunate incident that kept Washington's army from enjoying a nice beef meal that day. Jumping ahead another 65 years to 1842, we have a case of arson and attempted robbery. The story starts with a young man, John King, and his desire to marry the daughter of Mr. Sowers, a merchant in Skipbeckville. Mr. Sowers asked Mr. King about his financial situation to be assured that his daughter would be well cared for, and King replied that, although he had no money now, he would soon have a good supply. And apparently, Mr. King's business plan involved robbing the home of John Frick located on Orvilla Road in Hatfield Township. To do this, he set fire to a barn on the nearby property of Peter Frick, which was on what is now the Twin Woods Golf Course property. King's plan was that, while everyone was distracted and concentrating their efforts on the barn fire, he would rob John Frick's home during all of the commotion. It was suspected that John Frick, who was a rather old man, kept quite a lot of money in his house. As it happened, however, the elder Frick anticipated the chance of such a robbery, and so he kept his money in the home of a neighbor lady, Mrs. Morris, who lived nearby in the tiny village of Lyme Lexington. Mr. Frick had a very high opinion of Mrs. Morris, and she allowed him to hide his money under some rags in her attic. So anyway, John King did enter the Frick home during the commotion of the barn fire, but he was soon discovered while rummaging through the second floor. He managed to escape capture by jumping out of the window and onto the porch roof, then to the ground. He then fired his pistol to deter pursuit and successfully escaped. Someone must have recognized King, though, because he was soon arrested and brought to trial for arson. But John King's mother got him a very good lawyer, and the jury failed to convict him, there being some doubt as to if it was him that was seen fleeing the scene. Encouraged by his good fortune in escaping justice, King next broke into his girlfriend's father's store and stole a considerable amount of money and merchandise. Again he was arrested, but this time the jury convicted him and he was sentenced to seven years in the Eastern Penitentiary. King served his time, and when he got out, he returned to his mother's home in Culpsville, a changed man. Well, not really. He stole his mother's silver spoons, then disappeared and was never heard from again. Quite a guy. The first record of a murder in Hatfield is that of Frank Reeser in 1907. Seven years earlier, Reeser had built a hardware store on Maple Avenue near the sharp curve in the road, and he lived in the house right next door to the store. On the night of December 30th, 1907, Reeser had just ch closed his store, and as was his habit, he went to look over his horse and chickens before retiring for the night. While closing up his chicken house at 8 o'clock that night, he was attacked by two men who brutally clubbed him over the head, cracking his skull and bruising his face, no doubt with the intention of robbing him. Reeser's housekeeper heard the attack and screamed, frightening off the attackers before they got anything. Afterwards, Mr. Reeser stumbled into the house, grabbed his revolver, and fired it out of his bedroom window. 
That was the way that you summoned for help back then. Neighbors came rushing to help, but were too late to capture his assailants. Dr. Albright was summoned to attend to Reeser's wounds, and at 8 o'clock the following night, Dr. Albright, along with two doctors from Philadelphia, performed an operation to stop bleeding in Reeser's brain. The operation was a success, and it was hoped that it would save his life. Mr. Reeser was then taken by train to Episcopal Hospital in Philadelphia. He apparently withstood the trip quite well, considering his weakened condition, and eventually regained consciousness. Two weeks after the surgery, however, Reeser died of his injuries. County detectives conducted an investigation, but was unable to identify the culprit. So this is apparently Hatfield's oldest unsolved murder. On a bit of a lighter note, a 1908 Philadelphia Evening Bulletin newspaper article reported that Louis Hunoid, a Hatfield Borough barber, was arrested by police in Philadelphia and locked up for acting strangely on the streets. He told police that he had been banished from Hatfield for disturbing spiritual meetings. After he was taken to his jail cell, he then started his own revival service. The Evening Bulletin newspaper reported, his sanity will be questioned. Now, we don't know exactly how he was disturbing the Hatfield church gatherings, but perhaps he was simply an over-enthusiastic Pentecostal worshiper, which perhaps the more main street uh, churches of the uh, area were not accustomed to at that time. A brief newspaper article on January 16th 1913, reported on an apparent insurrection of sorts at the Orvilla train station and left more questions than answers. Details are few, but apparently three men were arrested and locked up in Norristown Prison, charged with taking possession of the Reading Railroad Station at the Orvilla Road crossing in Hatfield Township. No other details were given that we might know the reason for this act of rebellion but perhaps we will someday learn the full story. Later in 1913, it was the Hatfield train station that was in the news when it fell victim to arson. The old wooden train station was built in 1857 when the railroad first opened the Philadelphia to Bethlehem line. By 1913, the story goes, a group of Hatfield residents felt that they should have a better station. They felt that their station, which was now over 50 years old, was just too small, and that Hatfield deserved a bigger station. After all, Lansdale had gotten a nice new brick station 11 years earlier. Apparently, pleas to the railroad for a new station fell on deaf ears, so the word went through the community that if there should ever be an unfortunate accidental fire at the station, wink, wink, that no one should work too hard to put it out. Well, wouldn't you know, a mysterious fire did occur at the station one night. However, a well-meaning resident, who had apparently not received the verbal memo, quickly extinguished the flames. But lo and behold, in July 1913, another mysterious fire occurred, this time destroying the old station. One news article about the second train station fire stated that the fire could not be stopped because the railroad firemen were unable to find the Hatfield Fire Company's fire buckets. Could it be that the firemen had hidden their fire buckets? Interestingly, it seems that the fire company was not even summoned to respond to the burning train station, as the company's fire logbook contains no entry for July. A nice new modern brick train station was soon constructed to replace the destroyed station, much to the delight, I'm sure, of the Hatfield community. This next sad crime, the case of the baby's body found in a Hatfield roadway, again leaves us with unanswered questions. In January 1915, the Montgomery County coroner was called when the body of an infant was found lying on a road in Hatfield. It was assumed that the baby was thrown from the window of a passing train car of a train on the Bethlehem branch of the Reading Railroad. 
Again, no further details are known about this baby's mysterious death. In August of 1915, South Hatfield Postmaster John Huntsberger was arrested and charged with the embezzlement of $2,000. The South Hatfield Post Office was located in the South Hatfield General Store Building, seen here at the corner of Main and Vine Streets. Huntsberger was held on $3,000 bail until his grand jury hearing. Now in 1915, postage stamps were two cents each, so how he managed to embezzle $2,000 would be interesting to know, but unfortunately, we don't. The newspaper headline of this next crime story from August 31, 1916, was Chase for Robbers Like Movie Thrills. It went on to say that Hatfield Township folks might have thought that they were witnessing a thrilling motion picture chase being filmed when they saw two youths on bicycles being pursued by 15 bicycles, two motorcycles, three automobiles, and a horse and wagon. But it wasn't. It turned out that the two youths had been caught red-handed after they had broken into a home in Franconia Township and attempted to make their getaway on their bicycles. A chase ensued through Hatfield and into Montgomery Township, ending when they were captured in Montgomeryville. Now that's quite a chase on bicycles. And how they eluded capture for so long a distance, about five miles, is another mystery. The boys said that they had ridden from Wilkes-Barre in search of work and were just looking for something to eat when they broke into the home. Nothing of value was taken from the home, but the boys did get to enjoy a meal before being discovered and beginning the chase. Neither of the youths had any money, so they sold their bicycles to pay the cost of the fine. It was agreed that when they found work and had the money, their bicycles would be returned to them. The year 1918 was a difficult one for the world, what with the World War going on and a growing death count from the Spanish flu epidemic. But some men found a distraction from the events of the day in the sleepy little village of Calmer in Hatfield Township with a visit to Dottie Miller's summer home. Miss Miller was already quite well known by law officers for a famous brothel that she operated in Philadelphia. Late one Saturday night, state and local authorities paid a visit to Miss Miller's summer home in Calmer. Four officers swooped down upon her home, and a short time later, the officers, Miss Miller, and her employees were all headed to court in Norristown. After a hearing, during which some very lurid tales were told, all of the women were held for trial. Ms. Miller, who had plenty of experience with this procedure, was ready with her $2,500 in bail money. Two of her employees, Violet and Helen, got off easier with only $500 bail. They were all released with an order to appear for trial. During the trial, plenty of detailed, head-shaking tales were told by two customers of the establishment about the goings-on in the house. The judge sentenced the women to pay a fine or go to jail. Not surprised by the outcome, the defendants were all prepared to pay the fine, except for poor Helen. When she realized that she would be in prison, she cried out in protest that she was a decent, respectable girl. Immediately, a nervous gentleman spectator pulled out a big roll of bills, came to her rescue, and Helen was a free woman. With the fines all paid, the women piled into cars and sped off. Life returned back to normal in Calmer, but you can be sure that the raid at Dottie's house had tongues wagging in the quiet village for quite some time. A hundred years ago, some folks apparently did not take well to the increasing number of noisy, newfangled automobiles on the streets of Hatfield Borough. A newspaper article from 1920 reported that to show their disapproval, they took the metal caps from soft drink bottles, pushed sharp tacks through them, and spread them around on several of the borough's streets. This malicious act resulted in hundreds of dollars worth of damage to dozens of car tires which were punctured. 
Hatfield Borough Council offered a reward of $25 for information leading to the arrest of the guilty persons, but again, there is no indication that the culprits were ever found. The case of the exploding school stove began in early December 1920 when the coal stove at the Oak Grove one-room schoolhouse located on Berge Road exploded. The explosion seriously injured the teacher, Mrs. Olive Culp, whose face was badly burned. The stove explosion was first thought to have been an accident, perhaps caused by some gunpowder accidentally getting into the coal. But two weeks later, the discovery of a large quantity of shotgun shells and rifle cartridges in the stove made it obvious that it was no accident. Immediately on discovery of the shells and cartridges, pupils were dismissed and an investigation started. Had the shells not been discovered, it was said that there were enough explosives to not only wreck the stove, but possibly also set the school on fire and probably kill several children. The Pennsylvania State Police investigated, working on the theory that the deed was perpetrated by someone who had a grudge against the teacher or pupils. A few weeks later, state police arrested a 17-year-old boy, Albert Thymich, for the crime. Thymich, who had formerly been a student of the school, held a grudge after being told that he must pay tuition after he moved out of the Hatfield School District and into Hilltown Township. Following his hearing, unable to post the $1,000 bail, Thymich was committed to jail. In 1922, the United States was in the beginning of the Prohibition Era. The Prohibition Era, which lasted from 1920 until 1933, was a time when alcoholic beverages were essentially outlawed in the U.S., if you could imagine that. This kept police quite busy enforcing this law, even in the quiet village of Treewigtown in Hatfield Township. In March of 1922, state police seized a truck loaded with 30 barrels of whiskey at the Treewigtown Hotel, located on Bethlehem Pike near its intersection with Treewigtown Road. Five men and two women were also arrested in connection with the liquor seizure, and the barrels of whiskey were taken to the Montgomery County Prison Yard in Norristown. It must have been quite embarrassing for the state police when they opened the barrels and found them to be full of water. Oh well, and apparently it was not required that police return the barrels to the hotel since the prison warden stated that he would put them to good use in the making of sauerkraut at the prison. Also in March of 1922, George Berg, a Hatfield taxi cab driver, very mysteriously disappeared. A Hatfield youth, Albert Ramsey, reported to police that he was supposed to meet Berg at midnight at an abandoned water-filled quarry located in Franconia Township, halfway between Hatfield and Southern Burroughs. Now to help you get oriented, this is Township Line Road, this is the Hatfield Southern Pike, and this is the trolley line. And just a quick side note, this is the location of Gaiman's Trestle, a bridge that carried the trolley over Township Line Road. And here's a photo of the trestle. The old concrete bridge abutments are still there, so when Township Line Road reopens, take a drive down and check them out. Anyway, back to our story. The next day, young Ramsey reported to police that Mr. Berg never showed up and that he was concerned. Police investigated and found Berg's taxi cap floating in the water at the edge of the quarry, and traces of oil could be seen on the water's surface. After a search by divers, Berg's automobile was found to be at the bottom of the 55-foot deep quarry, but when it was raised from the water, Mr. Berg was not inside. Some thought that Mr. Berg had intended to dispose of his car in the quarry to collect on the insurance, and then accidentally slipped into the waters himself, drowned, and was probably still at the bottom of the quarry. But many believed that police would be wasting their time searching for Berg's body in the quarry, since they believed that after disposing of his car, 
Berg had left town with a woman who was not his wife and was far away by then. The mystery of Berg's disappearance finally ended three weeks later on April 8, 1922, when, as 600 people looked on, a diver recovered Berg's body from the quarry. Berg's death certificate reported that he accidentally drowned while pushing his automobile into the quarry. Our next crime story is titled The Saga of Dick the Dog and is one that drew national attention in 1922. Around 1920, while Jake Silverman and his daughter Rebecca were traveling through the countryside, they came across a man with a cute puppy, which was part Mastiff and part St. Bernard. Rebecca immediately fell in love with the pooch, so Jake agreed to purchase the dog for $5. The two chose to name their new family member Dick and took him home to live on their farm on Schwab Road in Hatfield Township. This was a problem, however, because Silverman, a Russian immigrant, was not a U.S. citizen, making it illegal for him to own firearms or a dog. In June of 1922, the Montgomery County Game Warden received a tip about Silverman's illegal dog, and being a rather hard man and eager to enforce the Pennsylvania law, he hurried out to the Silverman farm where he found the tip to be accurate. If ordered to appear in court and convicted, the law provided for jail time or a fine for the immigrant and a death sentence for the animal. Despite the pleas of Silverman and the tears of his daughter, Silverman was ordered to appear in court. Dick was as good as dead. During Jake's initial court appearance, the magistrate denied a petition to suspend the sentence and grant custody of the dog to one of Silverman's American-born daughters. He did, however, issue a 10-day reprieve so that he could review the case. The case of Dick the Dog quickly attracted nationwide publicity, and Dick became the best-known dog in Pennsylvania. U.S. President Warren G. Harding's wife, Florence, heard of Dick's plight and brought the case to the President's personal attention. Harding, in turn, wrote to the Pennsylvania governor, informally appealing for clemency for the dog, and the governor agreed that he would act, if necessary, to save Dick's life. But the governor's intervention was not required, since the magistrate decided to find Silverman and to spare the dog, although Dick could not stay on the Silverman farm. Instead, Dick stayed on the farm of a friend living in New Britain, and Silverman would occasionally visit the farm in order to see the dog. Dick had become so famous that he was invited to participate in Lansdale's 50th anniversary parade that year, 1922, and rode on a float which proclaimed that he was the most famous dog in the world. Now here's where the saga gets a bit fuzzy. One account says that in 1933, while Dick was being tethered in the barn on the New Britain farm and the family was attending church services, he was viciously beaten, apparently by poultry snatchers, while attempting to defend his home. He then had to be euthanized. But another account has a happier ending. It says that Jake Silverman studied hard for the next two years to learn English to be able to take the U.S. citizenship examination. Silverman passed the test became a naturalized citizen, Dick was returned to the Silverman family, and died of natural causes six years later. Let's all go with the second version. In 1934, Montgomery County, like every other place in America, was feeling the impact of the Great Depression and a time of great unrest for American labor, especially among the thousands of men and women employed in the textile industry. In 1933, several area mills went on strike, but the most turbulent was the strike at the Dexdale Hosiery Mill in neighbor, neighboring Lansdale Borough. In July of that year, about 400 picketers refused to follow an order to stay off of the streets, and eventually police used tear gas and even fired their weapons at strikers. The violent picketing came to Hatfield in September of 1934 
when strikers from out of town gathered early one morning at the Kaler Textile Company on East Broad Street in Hatfield Borough. When the employees started to arrive for work at the mill, the picketers started to hoot and howl and gang up at the gate. They were pushed back by special deputies, but when several cars entered the property, stones began to fly. One was hurled through a second-story window of the mill. When police and deputies apprehended the stone thrower, the picketers mobbed the deputies and clubs started to fly. Many of the picketers were injured in the melee and soon scattered and left town. At 11 a.m., a group of about 300 picketers arrived from Conshohocken and began threatening the employees and gathering stones and clubs. Robert L. Kaler, owner of the mill, met with strike leaders and it was agreed that if the mill was closed, that they would not attack the employees. The mill was closed at 3 p.m. and the employees were able to leave without incident. The strikers immediately left for Perkesee where they entered a silk mill and damaged it considerably. Mr. Kaler soon went to Harrisburg to meet with the governor about state police protection for the mill, which he apparently received and the mill was able to reopen. This next story is from a February 1939 Hatfield Times newspaper article that was titled, A Dirty Little Rat, and reported that there was someone in the community with such a black dead soul that they stole money being collected for victims of infantile paralysis. Postmaster Elmer Zepp reported that he had received reliable information which indicated that the yellow-bellied skunk who took the March of Dimes box from the post office counter at Broad and Cherry Streets was just a youngster. But he went on to encourage the culprit to return the box quickly or risk the wrath of the G-men since this theft from the post office was considered a federal crime. Hopefully the money box was returned. Across Cherry Street from the post office was the Hatfield Savings and Loan Association, and they had their share of theft problems in the 1950s. They were robbed twice. On the morning of January 23, 1952, Three men burst into the office armed with pistols and a shotgun. Office secretary, Miss Ruth Moyer, and, the, and an auditor she was working with were the only ones in the office at the time, and they were forced to face the wall while the thieves went through the safe and cash drawer, taking about $275. Miss Moyer and the auditor then had their hands taped behind them and were crowded into a washroom and left there as the bandits fled. Sometime later, they succeeded in attracting attention by shouting through a window. The bandits were subsequently arrested and sent to prison. Seven years later, on the morning of March 6, 1959, a young armed thief, about 22 years of age, wearing a very clever disguise of a rubber nose and real glasses and a real or simulated broken arm, again targeted the Hatfield Savings and Loan. But first, the bandit drove to the Hatfield train station. Around 8.45 a.m., he walked into the station and knocked on the inner office door. The station agent, Frank Miller, answered the door, and the bandit walked in, put a cigar box on the desk, and ordered Miller to put money in it. Miller took out his wallet and placed $25 into the box, and then he went to the cash drawer, where he took out another $31, which he added to the box. At this point, the bandit ordered Miller to get his hat and coat, and they went out to Miller's car together. At the wheel of the car, Miller followed the bandit's instructions and drove around the neighborhood for about 10 minutes. During the ride, the man asked some questions about I.C. Detweiler's general store and indicated that he was going to rob it as well as the savings and loan office. The bandit then ordered Miller to park in a position so that the clock on the front of the bank building at Main and Broad Streets could be seen. As they waited, watching the clock, the bandit told Miller exactly what he was to do when they got to the savings and loan. Shortly after 9 o'clock, Miller drove to the front of the savings and loan, got out of the car, 
hesitated a moment, and then walked into the building with the bandit about three feet behind him. In the office were Luther Moyer, secretary of the association, and his sister, Ruth Walter, the office secretary. Miller, following instructions, said, this is a holdup. Mrs. Walter and Mr. Moyer, who knew the station agent quite well, both laughed, but Miller quickly warned them, this man has a gun. The bandit proceeded to empty the cash drawers, taking about $260, and then ordered all three to lie on the floor, face down, before making his escape in Miller's car. Miller's car was soon found by Hatfield Borough Police Chief Herbert Kreider, parked at the rear of the train station property off of Maple Avenue, where the bandit apparently made his getaway in his own car. And there's no word on if the bandit was ever captured. Up next is the case of the murder of Harry J. Wallace. Back in 1959, Harry Wallace was a 52-year-old father of three, employed as the manager of Orange Cleaners on South Broad Street in Lansdale. It was a Saturday night, September 5th, 1959, that Harry Wallace sat watching TV in his easy chair in the living room of his home at the intersection of Cowpath and Lenhart Roads. This is what the house looked like around 35 years ago, but back in 1959, the porch wasn't screened in. Wallace's wife, Thelma, was working that Saturday night at her job at the Montgomeryville Mart, and the Wallace's 11-year-old son, Alan, and three-year-old daughter were upstairs asleep. Their 15-year-old daughter, also named Thelma, was enjoying a night of fun at West Point Park. At about 9.30 p.m., an unknown assailant fired a shotgun blast at Wallace through the screen of a side porch window, as indicated here on this photo. The shot struck Wallace on the left side of his head. Son Allen reported that, although he didn't hear the gunshot, he did hear some kind of noise downstairs, went to investigate, and found his father slumped in his easy chair, dead. Allen reported that, almost immediately, a man carrying a shotgun entered the living room and asked if anyone else was at home. Allen replied that he and his baby sister were the only ones there. Then, according to Allen, the man ordered him, you'd better not call the police about this, and then left the house. Allen did call police, and the Hatfield Township Police Chief, Harold Graham, along with the Montgomery County detectives and the state police, responded to the scene. This photo shows Chief Graham pointing to the window through which Wallace was shot. Initially, 11-year-old Allen was the police's main suspect. The house was torn apart in a search for the weapon he might have used, and a thorough search of the property, surrounding yards and barn, and even the trees was performed, but turned up no trace of a gun. This photo shows investigators using a metal detector to see if perhaps the shotgun was hidden in the underground cistern. Allen was questioned for hours by police who eventually determined that Allen would not have had the time to hide the weapon and was no longer considered a suspect. Members and friends of the family were questioned, and no one could think of any possible reason for the shooting. Police Chief Graham stated that this was the first murder in the history of Hatfield Township. A week or so after the murder, Chief Graham received a tip that the murder was actually a case of mistaken identity and that a man who lived nearby was the real target. Prior to the Wallace shooting, this man was rumored to be suspected by the police of pornography and he was said to have enemies that might want to harm him. Another theory was that the murder may have been mob-related since back at that time, the mob sometimes had connections to dry-cleaning establishments like the one that Harry managed using them as a cover for passing bedding slips. Neither of these theories could be substantiated, however, and the murder case of Harry Wallace dried up. 
the Wallace family later moved to New Jersey, and the murder of Harry J. Wallace to this day remains unsolved. Next is another murder which took place 11 years later in 1960, and I have titled this case, Holiday Homicide, The Murder of Janice Decker. The Society is fortunate to have in its collection the complete Hatfield Borough police file from this murder, including witness statements, the confession statement, and even crime scene photos. Now, I've done a whole program on just this one murder alone, using all this great information from the police file, but for this presentation, I will be giving just a, a brief summary. It had been a nice, happy Christmas holiday for the Decker family, which consisted of Bill Decker, a truck mechanic at Martin Century Farms, his 24-year-old wife, Janice, and their two-and-a-half-year-old son, Billy. Bill and Janice had met at Martin Century Farms, where they both had worked, and had gotten married in 1955, when he was 21 and she was 19. By 1959, they had bought a one-and-a-half-story Cape Cod house at 62 East School Street, and Janice had found a job closer to home at the Hanson Textile Company on East Broad Street, where she could walk to work. Christmas morning had been full of fun as the Deckers opened their presents. Santa had brought Billy, among other things, a truck that he could ride on and a spring rocking horse. Two days later, on December 27, 1960, at about 2.30 in the morning, Bill Decker finally crawled into bed next to his already sleeping wife. He had been having trouble sleeping recently because of back pain and used whiskey and bufferin to help him sleep. Bill slept briefly, restlessly, slipping in and out of consciousness. He woke at 3 a.m. when he heard a voice shout, Go ahead and kill her. Another voice in his head said, No, I love her. The voices battled in his brain until he finally walked out of the bedroom, down the basement stairs, picked up a piece of pipe, then went back up into the bedroom. The voices continued to yell in his head until he finally walked over to the side of the bed and struck his sleeping wife several times with the pipe. By 3.20 a.m., Janice Decker was dead. Bill knew that he had to get away, and Florida came to mind, even though he had absolutely no idea how to get there. He wrapped Janice's lifeless body in a blanket and placed her in a garment bag. Bill then picked up the body, carried it out the back kitchen door, into the rear garage door, and placed her into the trunk of his car. His plan was to bury his wife's body somewhere, so he grabbed a shovel from the wall of the garage, placed it in the trunk, and closed the trunk lid. Around 9 a.m., Bill Deckert took little Billy out to the car and pulled out of the driveway. Bill figured that he would drop little Billy off at a Catholic orphanage somewhere along the way to Florida. But before heading south, Bill needed money for his trip. So he drove to the Hatfield National Bank at the corner of Broad and Main Street. Decker waited until the hands on the bank's clock indicated that it was 9.30 and then went inside and withdrew $100. With cash now in his pocket, Bill Decker headed south. He didn't have the faintest idea how to get to Florida and it didn't help that he was somewhat directionally challenged. He got lost a couple of times, but by afternoon, he had found his way to Dover, Delaware. After getting lost yet again, Bill Decker came to the realization that he just couldn't get away with murdering his wife and decided that he would surrender to police. He started driving back north and feeling a sudden need to talk to a priest, started looking for a Catholic church. In Pennsylvania again, as he approached the small town of Linwood, Decker saw a sign that read, Holy Savior Catholic Church. Around 3.45, Bill carried his son to the door of the rectory, knocked, and then confessed to the young priest who answered the door 
that he had killed his wife and that her body was in the trunk of his car. The police were called and around 4.30 p.m. an officer arrived, inspected the car and found Janice's body. At 7.50 p.m. on December 27th, Hatfield Borough Police Chief Herb Kreider received a call from Pennsylvania State Police reporting that a murder had taken place in his jurisdiction. He was directed to go to 62 East School Street and secure the house so that no one could enter. At 8.15 p.m., a county detective arrived and entered the Decker house to gather evidence finding the living room glowing with a festive Christmas atmosphere from the lights on the tree, with no indication of the carnage that he would soon find in the bedroom. Police escorted William Decker to 60 West Broad Street in Hatfield Borough for a hearing before Justice of the Peace, Nathaniel Brown. Before the actual hearing started, Chief Kreider stood with Decker on the front porch of the magistrate's home to read the warrant to Decker in front of a large crowd of about 20 people, mostly reporters and photographers. Chief Kreider escorted Decker into the small office of Magistrate Brown, where a hearing on the charge of murder was held. As the testimony against him was read, Bill Decker showed absolutely no emotion. After the testimony was heard, Justice Brown ordered that Decker be held in Montgomery County Prison without bail to await his grand jury hearing. This photo shows Decker being es escorted out of Magistrate Brown's house on his way to Montgomery County Prison. Thirteen months later, in February 1962, a newspaper article indicated that a jury foreman had been selected for Decker's trial. But William Decker never did go to trial for murdering his young wife. Instead, he was committed to a state mental health facility, or an insane asylum, as they were known back then, for treatment. Six years later, he was released from the state hospital, apparently deemed to no longer be a danger to the public. William Decker worked and lived the next 46 years in the area until dying on January 3, 2014, at the age of 79. Changing gears again to a crime of a lighter nature, this is another case of hungry thieves. This photo, taken around 1957, shows Hartnett's sandwich shop at Cowpath and Orvilla Roads where Vinnie's Pizzerama most recently was. Back in 1961, the building was apparently being leased to Jake Longacre, who operated Longacre's restaurant there. A 1961 newspaper article headlined, Hungry Thieves Raid Restaurant Freezer, as they call after hours, reported that a bandit, or bandits, forced entry through a rear door of the building during the early morning heist. Township Police Chief Harold Graham estimated the value of the stolen items to be several hundred dollars. Taken in the hall was 50 pounds of hamburgers, 15 pounds of frankfurters, 3 pounds of bacon, a stack of barbecues, 6 chicken in a basket servings, 4 dozen hamburger rolls, 2 dozen hoagie rolls, a pound of boiled ham, 5 pounds of crab cutlets, and a carton of chocolate bars. The thieves also made off with 350 packs of cigarettes, a box of 50 cigars, and four decks of cards. Quite a haul they made. Again, no indication of whether the thieves in this case were ever caught. This next crime, the shootout at Susie's Lounge, is the one time in the history of the Hatfield Township Police Department in which one of its officers was shot in the line of duty. Susie's Lounge is located in Line Lexington, just across the County Line Road in New Britain Township. Now, for those of you not familiar with the establishment, Susie's was what was known back then as a go-go bar, a place where the dress code for its female dancers was, I would say, rather relaxed. The incident began between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning on February 2, 1968, 
when a patron of the bar, Stanley Klimek, a known career criminal, became drunk and belligerent and was told to leave, which he did. He then went out to his car, retrieved a pistol, went back to the bar where he found that the door had been locked since it was close to closing. Klimek was not happy about this, so he knocked out a window in the door with the butt of his pistol and fired a shot through the small window and into the ceiling of the bar. The bartender called police and 33-year-old Hatfield Township Police Patrolman Michael Murphy, who was patrolling Route 309 that night, was dispatched to the scene and told to proceed with extreme caution. When Murphy arrived at the scene, he ordered Klimek to put up his hands. The man refused and Murphy repeated his order several times again. Suddenly, Klimek fired several shots at Murphy. Officer Murphy later recounted that, quote, one bullet hit a pocket comb, the second bullet grazed my side, and the third one grazed my hair. Then I gave him a case of heartburn that even Rolaids wouldn't cure. Murphy had fired a number of shots at Klimek from his 38 caliber revolver, killing his attacker. Soon, fellow officers arrived and took Murphy to North Penn Hospital in Lansdale, where 90 minutes of surgery was required to clean and close the wounds. This newspaper photo shows officers during the investigation of the shooting. Officer Murphy recovered fully from his wounds, received a citation for valor, and was inducted into the Honor Legion of the National Police Hall of Fame. He continued to serve with the Hatfield Township Police Department until 1989, spending 25 years of his 30-year police career as a juvenile sergeant. This is a 1979 photo showing Sergeant Murphy. Next up is the case of the Forbidden Treehouse. It was in 1976 that Jonathan Selby constructed a treehouse on a property that he rented on the corner of Telmenson and Butler Avenues in Hatfield Borough. The treehouse, a rather big one, was 8 feet by 16 feet and built 30 feet high off the ground in a tall maple tree. The problem was the new structure violated the borough ordinance restricting the height of buildings in town. The treehouse was also built just 10 feet over some very important electrical wires, and should the structure come down in a storm or high winds, it could potentially knock out power to one-third of the borough, or worse yet, cause someone to be electrocuted. So borough officials ordered that the treehouse be removed. The 29-year-old Selby, who admitted that he was a bit of a rebel, decided that he didn't want to take down his treehouse. The controversy caused quite a media sensation, I'm sure thanks to some help from Mr. Selby. Newspapers throughout the region published articles on the great treehouse dispute. The borough eventually gave Mr. Selby an ultimatum, take down the treehouse or they would take it down for him and charge him for the service. Well, essentially, Mr. Selby thumbed his nose at the borough, so plans for Operation Treehouse removal were made to be carried out on Wednesday morning, July 28, 1976. Zero hour came and plans were executed with military-like precision. Hatfield Borough police cars, a Montgomery County Sheriff's cruiser, a dump truck, and a power line truck all pulled up to the Telmenson Avenue property together and work crews quickly barricaded off Butler Avenue. But Mr. Selby was already up in his fortress high above the ground. At first, he refused orders to come down and stood up in the treehouse holding an American flag. But when three officers began to climb the tree and a fourth began to rise in a line truck, Mr. Selby finally waved the white flag and descended the tree on his own. Borough workers quickly tore apart the treehouse lowering the pieces to the ground, threw them into the dump truck, and hauled them away. Operation Treehouse removal was a success, and the conflict was over. But two days after the treehouse was removed, the Philadelphia Inquirer editorial staff 
got the last word in when they printed this cartoon, making it quite clear as to what side of the great treehouse conflict that they were on. Our last case in tonight's presentation is the murder of Lady Shaw. On November 22, 1991, 76-year-old Lady Shaw, the longtime owner of the Hatfield Laundromat and Car Wash on Cowpath Road, just outside of the borough, was murdered by a man who had been released from prison just eight hours earlier. Carl Ray Swiger, a 29-year-old former meat cutter at Hatfield Quality Meats, had been released from prison at 9 o'clock that morning after serving a two-and-a-half-year sentence for robbery. At 5 o'clock that night, Swiger stopped at the Hatfield laundromat, stabbed Shaw with a knife, and stole money from him. Shaw managed to call police at 5.50 p.m., but had died before they arrived eight minutes later. Swiger managed to elude capture that night, but was apprehended the next day while buying new clothes at the James Way Shopping Center in Hilltown Township. Swiger was eventually sentenced to spend the rest of his life in state prison. And that is a look at some of Hatfield's crimes, big and small, over the past 250 years. I hope that you have enjoyed it, and thanks so much for watching.